All right, guys, we're back. Fabian for Liberty here. So yesterday, Ben Bernanke gave testimony before Congress, and Ron Paul brilliantly asked him, do you go to the grocery store? Um, which he said he does. I don't believe it. Uh, because anybody who tries to claim inflation is only running 2% is so detached from reality, it's impossible that they go grocery shopping. We all know prices across the board are up at least 10%, right? So, um, but Bernanke was, I think, a little bit more intelligent this time around in his testimony because usually when he says anything, gold and silver rally. Now, I did a video on Tuesday about silver versus fiat currency, and we know that ultimately gold and silver will win. But it is this epic struggle that is taking place between fiat currency, specifically the dollar, and gold and silver. Uh, silver yesterday was completely hammered. When I saw it this morning, it was down 30 cents as well, erasing almost all the gains uh, for the, not for the year, but erasing a significant amount of gains that it's, uh, that it's reached since its low of $26 back in December of last year. So what's going on, right? Now, as I said in that video, I usually don't get into the commenting of the day-to-day -day movements of silver or gold because I know ultimately where this thing ends. You do what you want to do. I'm stacking gold and silver because ultimately everything goes back to gold and silver. We have 5,000 years of history to tell us this, okay? The dollar is over. Now, we have in the past had a gold-backed dollar. And I touched on this as well because this is a concept that I've been kind of formulating in my mind, and it's um, really what the dollar is backed by now. We've had the gold-backed dollar. We defaulted in 1971 into the petrodollar. And now I would argue as we are on the last, you know, as we are trying to hold on, or not we, the banksters are trying to hold on to the petrodollar, we have literally have moved into a death-backed dollar. A dollar backed by death, a dollar backed by violence in the U.S. military, in essence, destroying anybody that stands in the way of the petrodollar system that has been implemented. Quick Reader's Digest history. We know back in 1945, after the uh, World War II ended, Europe was in complete devastation. And so in Bretton Woods in 1945, we have the emergence of a gold-backed currency. The dollar, U.S. dollar becomes the world reserve currency. Right? And the IMF and the World Bank were also created in Bretton Woods. And this system worked out fairly well until the 1960s, when we had Lyndon Johnson basically passed a great society, we had the war in Vietnam, and we had just reckless deficit spending begin to take place. In countries in Europe, like France and Spain, they were like, hey, wait a minute, this is not really working out. They started to convert their dollars for actual gold. So much so that Charles, President Charles de Gaulle of France literally had the French Navy come and escort their gold back to France. One of the greatest moves the French have made um, of, of getting gold back before Nixon closed the gold window in 1971. Now he did that with globalist Henry Kissinger. At the time, they understood that if we lose the gold back currency, there is not gonna be a demand for dollars right? Because we won't have the world reserve currency anymore. And that's a problem because if there's not a demand for U.S. treasuries, for dollars, that means the government can't have deficit spending to the level we have today. Americans can't have the lifestyle and the cheap gas and food prices and everything else that we enjoy here if we don't have a dollar that is being flooded into the global economy, which is what we have today. So they created the petrodollar. And um, the petrodollar basically was uh, King Faisal of uh, Saudi Arabia agreed when Kissinger said, listen, uh, accept only U.S. dollars as payment for oil and to invest any of those excess profits in U.S. Treasury notes and bills and bonds, right? By 1975, every member of OPEC uh, had agreed to sell their oil only in U.S. dollars. So what does that mean? That means that in essence, not only was it oil, but it was really anything. Central banks around the world had to have, uh, had to have their dollars in reserve because if they were going to you know, do business, they needed to do it globally with the dollar. Again, the example is that if you were France and you want to buy oil from Saudi Arabia, you would need to take your currency, the yen, or at the time, the, the, the franc, and you would need to convert it to dollars and then go and buy the oil. So the petrodollar created a system where the dollar was always needed, 
right? It was still going to be the world reserve currency. Every country needed to have dollars in order to function in a global scale in the global economy. Now, what did Saudi Arabia get in return? Well, in return, they were promised that their oil fields would be protected from countries like Iran, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Israel, um, and that they would be given a bunch of our military equipment. They would be given helicopters, bombs, bullets, tanks, whatever it may be. And that, and the Saudis were like, great, where do we sign up? But now we have entered a new phase in this petrodollar system. And that phase is very simple. That countries around the world, including China, India, um, Russia, are realizing that by participating in a dollar back, a petrodollar system, they have to reap the inflation that is being caused by the US dollar. Take China, for example. Food prices up over 230% in the last decade. Inflation is one of the biggest threats to the Chinese government and their ch absolute tyranny over those people. Because they know if people can't eat, if their rice is going up you know, 30% in one year, they're going to be really pissed off. Okay, And they're going to rebe rebe rebel against the government. And inflation is usually one of the driving indicators. Look at Egypt. Um, there's, you know, you, you could argue the U.S. State Department was responsible for those, I think, to a certain extent. But also, it's the timing. Because anytime you have an environment that is ripe for revolution, which like we do here in the U.S., one of the things that you need is you need inflation. You need high food prices, high gas prices. Because that's the last linchpin. You see, you have the... The forces that come in, like in Egypt, which in this case was the U.S. State Department, who came in, trained the revolutionaries to take advantage of the anger that was out in the street because of high gas prices, because of not high gas prices, but high food prices and high energy prices in Egypt, right? So that was a perfect combination to cause a revolution and topple Mubarak. So countries around the world are realizing by participating in the dollar the, the petrodollar system, they have to reap the they, they have to deal with the inflationary pressures of the Federal Reserve printing massive amounts of dollars. So what you've seen is you've seen the uh, Chinese, the Russians, the Brazilians, the Indians, uh, many countries begin to get out of the dollar. China the other day announced, or, or the tick data was released the other day by the U.S. Treasury, showed that China is uh, selling. U.S. bonds, their, their holdings of U.S. treasuries is down 15% over the last year. 15% from 1.35 trillion to 1.1 trillion, right around there. They're getting out of U.S. treasuries. We know the Russians have gotten out of U.S. treasuries and many other countries are doing the same thing. Which leads me back to my question of, well, who's buying all the U.S. treasuries? Of course, it's the Federal Reserve. History will show, I believe, that in this time period, the amount of counterfeit bonds, counterfeit phony digital money created will be in the tens of trillions of dollars. That was created at the very last stage, the end game of the petrodollar system. That's why you see stories break every other month. There's a story of, hey, we just found six trillion in fake bonds, or hey, we caught two Japanese men with 200 billion in fake bonds. The Secret Service, remember, says there's over a hundred of these instances a year. How many of those are not legitimate countries that are A, either trying to just get out of the dollar and do it secretly for their holdings don't go down in value? Or is it really just the Federal, gov the Federal Reserve, the U.S. government, printing trillions of dollars, flooding the market to buy cheap assets? Like this 15 trillion that was laundered through HSBC uh, that I reported on just a few days ago, or over the weekend. The petrodollar is being challenged as we speak. This was from Zero Hedge. Iran moves further to end petrodollar, announces it will accept payments in gold instead of US dollars. China, India, Russia, they're preparing to phase out of the petrodollar, a move which would be impossible if there was not bilateral trade partners, right? You need to have a willing partner. Now, Europe will not agree to this because they're under NATO. And that's why it leads me to my theory that I'll get to in just in one second, which is this death back dollar. But countries in the East that are wanting to have economies like the West, that have you know, the BRIC countries, Brazil, um, India, 
China, these countries, South, South Africa, Russia, these countries want to have an economy like the U.S. They want to have consumers and they want to have, you know, cars and all kinds of other things we have here in the West and we take for granted. But in order to do that, they need to have, um, they, they can't continue with the U.S. dollar system because it creates kind of like this bondage type system, if you will. So what has the, what has the U.S. government done? Well, since 9-11, the... Uh, since 9-11, U.S. military spending is up over a trillion dollars. We now have U.S. Uh, Arab, we now have military bases worldwide, and at least 800 military bases worldwide. Uh, there is a presence of U.S. military personnel in over 156 countries. Over half a million of U.S. troops are deployed worldwide. In Iraq, if you remember the story that the mainstream media covered, was how Obama so gloriously ended the troop presence or pulled out the army of Iraq. Now true, there's about 100,000 personnel still left there, a mix between private contractors and, the, uh, and still about 25,000 US military. But they just kind of swapped them out for uh, private contractors, which is another way we have troops everywhere is through these private companies. Look at now the State Department. The State Department literally now has their own military, a private force of, you know, contractors that are not accountable to Congress or to we the people. They're accountable to Hillary Clinton. Why is all this happening? Why the crazy buildup of U.S. military forces around the globe? 8,000 Marines were just sent to Australia uh, not too long ago to help offset the growing influence of the military of China in that region. We have troops now in over five countries in Africa alone. The list is growing and growing on a daily basis. I actually had a list, and we'll play the list here, of every country the U.S. has a military presence in. It is quite frankly staggering. We are all over the world. Now why? Well, I believe it's because Forces within the U.S. government know the handwriting is on the wall. They know China, who is a big backer of Iran. China gets 15% of all of their gas and oil and everything else from the, uh, from the Iranians. They're more important to China. Iran is more important to China than Saudi Arabia is to the U.S. China is not going to allow the U.S. to just go in and invade Iran. And I guarantee you behind the scenes, this is one of the biggest factors that has been delaying that invasion. The Central Bank of Iran has now come out and said, hey, we're going to take gold or other currencies for our oil. So we know India is trading with Iran in gold. China has a ton of gold they've been buying. I've documented that in my last couple of videos. Uh, and they're going to be using gold to buy or their, or their currency to buy um, oil from Iran. Countries like Japan and South Korea they didn't really want to go along with this whole idea to stop buying oil from Iran. And the likelihood of them continuing to do so, I think, is rather significant. So we're being challenged, right? The challenge is to the petrodollar, to the petrodollar system. Countries are realizing we need to get out of the system, and the U.S. government is, in essence, I believe, with their military now backing the dollar by force. You try to get out of the petrodollar system, we will kill you. Look at Libya, Muammar Gaddafi, rumored to have wanted to begin to trade his oil for some kind of gold-backed currency or some kind of new currency. He was killed by Al-Qaeda rebels, nonetheless. I mean, literally, Al-Qaeda rebels that were funded, financed, and supported by NATO and by the U.S. government. I thought Al-Qaeda Al -Qaeda was the enemy, but... It seems like we're using them in Syria as well. Another country who not only has major ports to deliver this oil to the West, but they're a key, key country. So it's about having the military all over the world to literally kill, invade, or just label, hey, you're a terrorist. That's why back in 01, after 9-11, it was the war on terrorism, right? This global war on terrorism that, re that called for an expansion of U.S. troops across the Middle East, but it's because we need to be in these countries that have the oil reserves so that we can protect those oil reserves from anyone who tries to challenge the petrodollar system.
people in this government know. And that's, again, why we're seeing, and I said this in my trends and predictions video, record amounts of US politicians will be retiring. Just this last week, we had two more, one of them, Olympia Snow, who didn't even tell her staff she was going to be retiring up until a few hours before the press conference. No reason why. She's just gone. They know what's coming. They know that not only are we in the beginning of a world war, World War III, or some, what will be called probably something else, but we are in the midst of the end of the dollar as the world reserve currency, of the petrodollar system. It is being challenged as we speak. This war is already being fought between China, Russia, Iran, India, and the US. And it's not going to end really too pretty because as we've already seen, the bankers, the banking cartel that runs this country will do anything and everything that they have to do to retain their ability to have control over whatever the currency system is. And that's why they have done that through NATO right now. It's another reason why they want to build this NATO missile defense shield to contain Russia and the growing threat of Russia's huge, vast amount of oil and energy, Russia being the number one exporter of oil in the world. The petrodollar system, I believe, is coming to an end. And like the end of many of these global systems, they end usually, history tells us, in massive chaos and violence. It's happening right now throughout the Middle East. I mean, how come we're not in Africa where there's all kinds of humanitarian disasters taking place? Well, there's not really oil there. There's all kinds of other uh, vast resources, but not oil. Oil's the important one because, again, oil backs the petrodollar system. And that's why we're in the Middle East. That's why we're going to go to war with Iran, or we want to go to war with Iran. So I wanted to bring you this series. Would love to hear your comments on it. We had the gold back dollar. That's done. Defaulted in 1971. Then we created the petrodollar system. And I'm arguing that that is on its way out. And it will merge into being backed by a death back dollar. You try to challenge the petrodollar system, they will kill you. And that's what I believe the reason is. We have troops all over the world, specifically concentrated in a huge amount in the Middle East. Love to hear your feedback on this. I'm your internet anchorman, Fabian for Liberty. Thanks for watching. I'm out.